Thank you very much. Uh, the last question goes to Bloomberg News, please. Thank you. Um, I'm Margaret Talib with Bloomberg News. Mr. President, uh, you're here, of course, to talk about Asia, but much of the world's attention and yours is also being diverted back to the Middle East now and the situation in Gaza. Um, you're calling for a de-escalation of the violence between the Israelis and the Palestinians. I'd like to ask you, do you believe that a movement of Israeli ground troops into Gaza would be an escalation, and do you support such a move anyhow? And um, do you, are you concerned that the Arab Spring, at least in the near term, has made matters worse? And does the violence there complicate your pivot to Asia? And um, Madam Prime Minister, uh, you may know the President's uh, first visit today was to the Royal Monastery, uh, where he told a monk that he will need a lot of prayer to help the U.S. avoid a fiscal crisis. Uh, it was sort of a joke, kind of, right? Um, what can emerging democracies in Asia take away from how difficult it has been for the president to get Congress to agree to budget negotiations with him, and why shouldn't China's system of government look more appealing in this region when you confront a situation like this in the U.S.? Thank you. Well, uh, let me start with Gaza. Um, Let's understand what the precipitating event here was uh, that's causing the current crisis. Uh, and that was an ever-escalating number of missiles that were landing not just in Israeli territory, but in uh, areas that are populated. And there's no country on Earth that would tolerate missiles raining down on its citizens from outside its borders. So uh, we are fully supportive of Israel's right to defend itself from missiles landing on people's homes and workplaces and potentially killing uh, civilians. And we will continue to support Israel's right to defend itself. Now, what is also true is, is that we are actively uh, working with all the parties in the region to see if we can end those missiles uh, being fired without further escalation uh, of violence in the region. Uh, and so I've had several conversations with Prime Minister Netanyahu. I've had several conversations with President Morsi of Egypt. I've spoken to Prime Minister Erdogan uh, of Turkey, who uh, was visiting uh, Egypt right in the midst uh, of what was happening in Gaza. And uh, my message to all of them was uh, that uh, Israel has every right to expect that it does not have missiles fired into its territory. If that can be accomplished uh, without uh, a ramping up of uh, military activity in Gaza, that's preferable. That's not just preferable for the people of Gaza, it's also preferable for Israelis, because if Israeli troops are in Gaza, uh, they're much more at risk uh, of incurring fatalities or uh, being wounded. Uh, you know, we're going to have to see what kind of progress we can make in the next 24, 36, 48 hours. Um, but what I've said to uh, President Morsi and, and Prime Minister Erdogan uh, is that uh, those who champion the cause of the Palestinians uh, should recognize that uh, if we see uh, a further escalation of the situation in Gaza, then the likelihood of us getting back on any kind of peace track that leads to a two-state solution uh, is, uh, is going to be pushed off way into the future. And you know, so if we're serious about wanting to resolve this uh, situation and create a, a genuine peace process, it starts with uh, no more missiles being fired into Israel's territory. Uh, and that then gives us the space uh, to tr try to deal with these uh, uh, longstanding conflicts that exist. In terms of the, the impact of the Arab Spring, let's just remember that the exact same situation arose just a couple of years ago before the Arab Spring. 
So I, I, I don't think anybody would suggest uh, somehow that uh, it's uh, unique to democratization in the region that there is a conflict between uh, the Israelis and the Palestinians. That's been going on for several decades now. Um, I do think that uh, as uh, Egyptians, Tunisians, others have more of a voice in their government, uh, it becomes more important for uh, all the players, including the United States, uh, to speak directly to uh, those populations uh, and to, to deliver a message that uh, peace is preferable to war, that this is an issue that can be resolved if uh, parties are willing to sit down and negotiate directly, that violence is not an answer, uh, and that uh, there are no shortcuts to the hard work of trying to bring about uh, what I think is the best option, uh, two states living side by side in peace and security. And, and that, that's a message that you can't just direct at a single figure in uh, these Arab countries. Now you've got to be able to deliver that message uh, across the board. And that, uh, uh, that will probably be a little bit harder. Um, but the truth is, is that for any peace that was going to last, that was going to be necessary anyway. Uh, last point, I know it wasn't directed at uh, me, it was directed at the Prime Minister, but I'm just going to make this point. First of all, uh, I always believe in prayer. Uh, I, I, I believe in prayer when I go to church uh, back home, uh, and if, if a Bud Buddhist monk is wishing me well, I'm going to take whatever good vibes he can give me uh, to, to try to uh, deal with uh, some challenges back home. Uh, I'm confident that we can get uh, our fiscal situation dealt with. And I think uh, it's important to, to, to recognize that, uh, yeah, democracy is a little messier than uh, alternative systems of government, uh, but that's because uh, democracy allows everybody to have a, have a voice. And that system of government lasts, and it's legitimate. And when agreements are finally struck, uh, you know that um, nobody's being left out of the conversation. And that's the reason for our stability and our prosperity. Uh, and uh, the notion somehow that uh, you can take shortcuts uh, and avoid democracy and that that somehow is going to be uh, the mechanism whereby you deliver economic growth, I think is absolutely false. I think over time, when you look at the most prosperous nations on this earth, they are the ones uh, in which every individual, every citizen feels like if they put in uh, the effort, if they're working hard, that those efforts bear fruit, that a government respects them and observes rule of law and doesn't take their property uh, w uh, without uh, due process, and uh, they don't have to pay a bribe to start a, a business uh, or get a telephone installed. And you know, it's worked for us for uh, over 200 years now, uh, and I think it's going to work for Thailand and it's going to work for this entire region. Uh, and the alternative, I think, is uh, a, a false hope that over time, uh, I think, erodes uh, and collapses under uh, the, the weight of people uh, whose aspirations are not being met. I know you didn't direct that question at me, but I just wanted to make sure. You, Prime Minister didn't get put on the spot without me having something to say about that. All right? Yeah, for my answer, I think uh, talk about the basic of the economic growth. I think we still believe that uh, uh, for my, my statement said that the democracy will be the fundamental. I think this is still valid, but this is the one way of the basic of the fundamental because as long as you have the stability in the political. So it will be the stability of economic. But anyway, in the economic, we'll be have to understand the cause and the root cause of the problem in the right way to solve. 
the problem. And also that as long as you, you work with the, stick with the principle of the financial, but along the way you need to balance of the growth of the economy because I think uh, still have any place on the blue ocean so we can find as long as if we find the right place at the right time so the growth is still going. So I think we, I believe like that. Thank you. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, just a final program note, the joint press statement uh, in English and unofficial translation in Thai will be circulated shortly. Um, so we thank you for your cooperation. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Madam Prime Minister. Uh, this concludes the joint press conference. And please be seated. There's the President, President Obama, and the Prime Minister of Thailand there at the press conference, uh, just wrapping up about, uh, about 40, 45 minutes or so. They touched on everything from Thai food that the President was going <laughs> to yeah. eat uh, to uh, what's going on in Israel. That question, of course, came up, and also human rights abuses in and around the Asian region as well. Two real observations from the folks on Twitter this morning, and one is the relative attractiveness of the Prime Minister of Thailand, another being the President's <laughs> thoughts beautiful. on Thai food food. I mean, that is that is going deep, but that is speaking my but language. But she was also very smart, and the president complimented her on her English. She yeah, she spoke, English. she came out and spoke yeah. first in English, right. and the president was saying, I, I can't try that. I'm not going to speak in Thai. But anyway, let's go to Wendell Goler, who is traveling with the president right now in Bangkok. Some takeaways, uh, Wendell, from that press conference. There are a lot of uh, topics covered this morning.